Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We're kicking off day two now, and uh, I think everybody's had their strong coffee, or at least some of you have had your strong coffee. The first thing on the agenda this morning is Tom Stevenson. Uh, it's Tom is the, the Pro Vice Chancellor of Cranfield University. Cranfield have been big supporters and partners collaborating and working with us at uh, Clean Equity. And I shall hand over to you, Tom. Thank you very much. Well, good morning to everybody in Monte Carlo. I hope you've enjoyed your coffee. I've certainly enjoyed mine. And hello to those of you that are joining me from around the rest of the world. I'm going to talk about Cranfield University's Enterprise Acceleration and Incubation. My name is Professor Tom Stevenson. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at Cranfield. And I'm very proud to be presenting to you as a supporter of Clean Equity Monaco. I think this is our fifth year here, uh, so delighted to meet you. For those of you that don't know us, Cranfield University is focused on technology and management. We aim to undertake transformational research, relevant education and continuing professional development to help industry, governments and non-governmental organisations. Key fact is that we are exclusively postgraduate, so we only deliver degrees at master's and PhD level. So what drives us? Well, we have a deep understanding of technology, which we match to world-class knowledge for business from our business school. Um, you'll see here is our Aircraft Integration Research Centre, and this is a partnership between Cranfield, Airbus and Rolls-Royce. So we really do work intimately with industry. And we offer a full spectrum of help to people developing their technology from the protection of intellectual property right through to setting up companies, entrepreneurship and helping raise finance. That's what motivates us as a university. As well as combining this deep understanding of technology with uh, world-class entrepreneurship, we're organised differently to conventional universities. We have eight themes. So they range, as you can see on this slide, from aerospace all the way through to water. So we're involved in energy and power, environment and agri-food, manufacturing, transport systems. We have a long-term relationship with the UK Ministry of Defence. So we have a theme on defence and security and, of course, our School of Management. A key fact. We are 
probably the most engaged university in the UK with industry. We are number one when you measure the amount of income we get from research per academic. We have a business school that is triple accredited and we have won the prestigious Queen's Anniversary Prize five times now. What I'm now going to do is just run through eight examples of the things that we do to help you in your enterprise, to help you incubate your business, to help in entrepreneurship. So the first one I'd like to talk about is the Oxford to Cambridge arc. This has been recognised by the UK government as a key part of the country for development of high tech businesses. And the nine universities within the region, from the University of Oxford through to the University of Cambridge, have got together to help in that aspiration. And you'll see from this map that Cranfield is right at the heart of this region. And indeed, we run the secretariat for this organisation. And you'll see that we add billions to the economy. We are also a member of the Midlands Innovation Group of Universities, who you can see listed at the bottom of this slide. We are involved in one major project there that is called the Energy Research Accelerator. And this is about undertaking research at the lower TRLs, technology readiness levels, right through to near market development. So right through to TRL 8. And we've got a range of 23 facilities that have been co-funded between industry and government. So a great example is uh, the production of hydrogen. And we're in the middle of a £6 million project on our Cranfield site for hydrogen manufacturing facilities. For those of you that have um, seen me before at Clean Energy, Johnson Mathy, they came to us looking to find startups, spin-outs, SMEs from across the globe who are involved in the agri-food sector. And we launched a joint programme to work together between Cranfield, providing facilities, research expertise, expertise in commercialisation, along with support from Johnson Mathy and for SMEs to develop their own technologies whilst they maintained ownership over their own intellectual property. It was a great programme and we had a lot of success with our partners. Another one that we've recently run is an innovation competition with Unilever that involves our students. We have a very lively student population. Their average age is in their early 30s and many of them take our courses in design. And they have helped Unilever to think about uh, new and novel products. Um, I have to say the last time it was in the ice cream sector and if there's one way to attract students to a project, that's to offer them free Magnum ice creams. Again, our sponsors were delighted with the results of this programme. Technologies at the Cranfield campus. We have a partnership with Barclays Bank, one of the UK's largest high street banks and a major investment bank uh, in the city of London. They support incubation centres across the company, country called Eagle Labs, and we have the only partnership as a university with the bank, uh, which is focused mainly on Avtech, so that's aviation and aerospace technologies. Linked to this incubator, we are now developing grow-on facilities, and this is under a scheme known as Aviate Plus, where we're building bigger facilities to uh, further enhance and match what we've already got in the Cranfield Eagle Lab makerspace, which also have airside access to our airport, uh, which I'll say a little bit about uh, at the end of this talk. We also work very closely with a broad ecosystem of in innovators, and this includes our alumni network, of which we have almost 170,000 around the beg your pardon, around 70,000 uh, around the globe. We, we put together uh, a scheme known as the Cranfield 50, which takes some of our most successful alumni where they offer 
free support to burgeoning startups, spin outs, and help students with their ideas. And this is the eighth of eight slides showing you what we do. So this um, lists some of the um, spin out companies and startup companies that we have on campus. Um, some of you will know the second one uh, on here, which is Corrosion Radar Limited, started by Dr. Praffel Sharma, who actually was an award winner at a previous clean equity. Uh, the company goes from strength to strength and are currently uh, raising further finance at, the, at this moment. The first company mentioned on this list, uh, WAM3D, is the result of academic work and uh, one of our academics has left the, the university to become the CEO and we've just raised money from uh, a number of funds including uh, a Singapore sovereign fund. Here at Tech 8, one of the companies as well is another student-led startup that has some highly innovative technology in the drone market. So to summarise, we are a university that works very closely with business and these are some of the companies who support us and have given us permission to mention their names uh, in talks such as this. Please do visit Cranfield. We do own and operate our own airport. Uh, your eyes may be drawn to the plane, but actually it's the uh, tower that's to the other side of the slide that is important. We have an airport with the first uh, virtual control tower of any scale in the UK. So please, do come and visit us. You can park your plane in one of our capacious hangars. And if you wish to know more, please do contact me either by phone or email. Thank you very much for your attention. So for the first technology company presentation this morning in Monaco, uh, and thank you everyone for, for joining us again today for, for day two. I'd like to introduce uh, Stephen Kubicki, uh, CEO at Energy OS, joining us from Australia. Uh, thank you, Connor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Stephen Kubicki. I'm the CEO of Energy OS. Uh, we are, of course, disappointed not to be there in person, but nonetheless very excited to be part of the program. Um, and before I start, I would like to thank the organisers, particularly the Innovator Capital team, uh, for their support. Um, but also make the comment that it's an amazing cohort and one that we're really proud to be a part of. Um, I'll get to our software in a moment, but we see our energy services as a mass market enabler of clean energy technologies. And so the clean equity community for us um, has the potential to be a very powerful resource and actually we're really keen to um, get in touch with some of the other presenting uh, companies over the journey. Okay, so I'll get to it. So Energy OS, uh, Energy OS is an enterprise software company. We're based in Australia. Uh, our software helps utilities transition to a clean, distributed and bi-directional uh, energy system. And there are three key messages that I'd like to focus on today. First, um, the technology credentials. We have a mature and very versatile technology. It was originally developed by one of the world's leading R&D institutions um, and specifically designed to respond to the very profound changes happening across the sector as it evolves to clean energy. Um, and utilities in particular are forced to integrate the types of technologies that have been showcased over the last couple of days. The next theme that I'd like to emphasize is our company credentials. In terms of our company's maturity, we have now achieved mass market penetration in our home market of Australia. Um, and we've demonstrated a business model that creates cumulative recurring returns that are sticky and that are also cumulative in the sense that we can grow revenues aggressively, but off a stable base. And the last point um, or the last theme to, that, that um, will recur through the presentation is 
the opportunity and we are ready to expand into new markets. Um, our technology is massively scalable. It translates to international markets and beyond just having the company infrastructure to scale, we've also invested um, a lot of time into that broader ecosystem and um, creating partnerships that will give us credible, targeted, uh, and very personalised introductions to the utilities that will be the best fit for our services. The business description. Before I start with the business description, I'll quickly frame the, the problem we address and present it from the point of view of the incumbent utilities. Um, so the energy system is undergoing profound change. That's obviously very well understood by this audience, and so I won't labour the point. Um, but at a, at a very high level, we're evolving from a centralised one directional system with consumers at the end of the value chain to a radically different system with clean, um, clean and intermittent energy, bi-directional and of course highly distributed. And that change being imposed on a system that has been designed for a different era and income utilities don't know how to respond. So utilities need to embrace these extraordinary technologies, things like batteries, solar, wind, uh, EVs and AI, but to do so properly, they need to digitise their business. Um, and that's what our software does. We give utilities a foundational platform, uh, which is a kin energy operating system, hence the name Energy OS, and it helps them engage their customers and also participate in the evolution of the sector. Our software is called EOS. It is cloud-based, it's an enterprise scale solution uh, and it delivers digital energy services. And we offer it as a white label solution to utilities uh, using a SaaS software as a service business model. I won't go through our corporate history in too much detail, um, but the company is now six years old uh, and we can break that um, timeline down into five fairly basic chapters and it's really the last two that i have to focus on as we go through the presentation so the software was originally developed by australia's national science agency and it was developed to deliver universal energy services to potentially every site in australia energy os acquired the rights to the software in 2014 and our team includes uh, the software engine that originally headed up digital energy services at CSIRO, uh, who co-founded um, our team. We have worked on a range of pilots uh, with leading utilities and made very significant investments in um, getting the utility feedback to design our servers. And it's really these last two milestones that I'd like to emphasise. The first one I'll call our mass market milestone. In, in 2019, we achieved a very important milestone. That was our first mass market program in Australia. Uh, we are now delivering digital energy services to 100,000 commercial sites. That's about 10% um, of Australia's SME market, small to medium enterprise market. And we've also been contracted to roll out the software to a further 600,000 residential sites, which will be about 6% of Australia's um, market. So we've got a, a program that delivers at scale um, and is ready to be extended into new markets. The, the next one I'll point out is, is really, and I'll call it the ecosystem milestone. And, and since that program, we've been working very closely with some of the sector's leading technology vendors, um, enterprise software companies like SAP and Oracle, as well as others like AWS um, on cloud. Um, and what we're doing is working very hard to cultivate a sales channel that'll let us um, deliberately target the utilities that have the best appetite for our services. So we are ready to grow. We've got a solution that will let us grow quickly. And we've got an ecosystem in place um, that we can use to grow in a very deliberate and strategic way.
the technology, look, at its simplest, the software that delivers digital energy services. And we're extremely proud of the technology. Um, we'd be delighted to uh, take it for a deeper dive in follow-up meetings, but I'm not going to be a key theme of the presentation. Um, I'll instead describe it in very general terms and perhaps call out some features that might be of interest. Um, Energy OS or EOS uh, is the name of our platform, delivers essentially a library of services upstream to utilities and then also downstream to consumers. So it's effectively a, a platform technology. It's a highly sophisticated technology and um, it uses an operating system architect, hence the name Energy OS. And it's been designed to implement a digital strategy for utilities that is custom fit for their specific business requirements, um, that leverages their own digital and technology investments, uh, things like you know, billing systems, uh, cloud, um, as well as a range of you know, emerging and other piloted technologies that they're involved with. It helps integrate consumer technologies behind the meter technologies, such as IoT devices, rooftop solar, which we heard yesterday is um, you know, a, a, a very big story in Australia, batteries and EVs. It's also extremely versatile, and we've now used it in commercial programs that cover a range of different services, such as tariff reform, solar PPAs, um, batteries, peer-to-peer -peer trading using blockchain, demand response portfolio services, um, and things like solar on public housing. And, and I'll pause just quickly there because it, it touches on a theme that, that came up in the, in the um, plenary sessions yesterday. Um, and, you know, one of the things that digital services does, in addition to kind of creating that mass market um, or, or supporting that mass market rollout of new technology is give access to those sorts of technology to uh, customer segments that otherwise might not, might not be able to afford them. And so we've done a number of solar on public housing, we've done a number of hardship programs and uh, so forth, which, which really emphasises the kind of critical role uh, that digital services can play um, and also the kind of mass market scope of them. And then the last point I'll make on the technology, it uses a low risk architecture and, and it petitions, um, you know, it's petitioned from the core billing and other corporate systems of the utilities, um, you know, which make it um, sellable. We are technology agnostic. Uh, it implements quickly and it can be massively scaled. Market size. So Energy OS is now the leading digital energy services provider in Australia by customer numbers. Um, and effectively, we want to take what we're doing in Australia and uh, apply it into new markets. We've invested deeply in, in terms of how to do that in a highly targeted way. Uh, we've developed the technology, as I mentioned before, with extensive feedback from our utility customers. But we've also been working across that wider ecosystem um, of technology vendors to the, to the sector, including industry heavyweights like SAP, Oracle and AWS. That work has been extensive. It's been a big focus for us. Uh, it's involved subject matter experts from, um, you know, a vast array um, across their organisations, including product sales, utility industry partnerships and so forth. Um, and it also has spanned uh, a number of different markets. So that has given us a solution that directly aligns with their own product roadmaps. Uh, and importantly, also though, their in incentive structures. So we have sales channels that support a credible and highly targeted strategy to, to expand into new markets. Those relationships are at various stages. SAP is probably the most mature and is now actively introducing us to potential customers. Um, and the next program that we're targeting in New Zealand is um, a great example of that. AWS is another example that will also start introducing us to their utility customers shortly. 
But even beyond that, we see a very clear path to expand the ecosystem. And so again, some of the comments made in the plenary session yesterday um, resonate very strongly with what we're trying to do in terms of our corporate strategy. The team. Oh, I think I've, apologies, skipped over market size. Yes, I have. So I'll go back a slide, market size. So we see, as I said, um, digital energy services is a key enabler for clean energy. And so accordingly, the market size is significant. Um, and it's projected to grow strongly. I think more relevance is the market strategy, which I've kind of done in reverse, but how we want to partner across that ecosystem and be very um, deliberate and targeted in terms of how we um, target that market. But the point I will make um, rather than slip, skip over this slide is that we can effectively break down our services into two fairly crew categories. The first one is our data services. That's really using the utilities of data um, and it focuses on customer engagement and product differentiation and extension for utilities. Those services low cost, uh, they can implement and, and they can also be implemented at scale to entire customer bases overnight. And the other um, category of services or family of services is our more sophisticated administration and load control services. And in fact, those basic data services give us an invaluable beachhead to really sell into those more sophisticated services. They are really integrating new technologies such as IoT, um, you know, rooftop solar and responding to intermittent generation and so forth. Um, so those markets for orchestration and load control, they're, they're still recent. Uh, uh, emerging, um, but we we see them as um, support, very powerful long-term growth story for us. Okay, skipping past market, the team, um, a bit like the technology, I can't do justice to the team in the short time we've got. Um, I can confidently say we've got a world-class team, it includes software engineers that originally developed the technology. Um, and it also includes members that have uh, direct experience in, in large scale digital transformation projects with, um, you know, large incumbents like, uh, you know, government departments and other large corporates. Um, the last thing I'll say on the team is, you know, that they are a deeply committed team. We have a, a, a great group and um, frankly, creating a, a culture that we're really proud of. Okay, to the funding, we are at a really exciting point in our life cycle. And, and in getting here, we've been disciplined about in how we've raised and deployed capital. Um, we, we now wanna scale and we wanna do that with a strategic partner that can help us aggressively grow our business. So our immediate term deliverable is to launch an additional mass market program that will entrench us, will entrench our leading position, Australia and New Zealand, but it'll achieve three important objectives. It will integrate EOS with both of the industry's dominant ERP vendors, both um, AP and Oracle. Um, it'll create um, recurring revenues of approximately 2 million Australian per year. Um, so that equates to about 1.2 euro, 1.1 sterling. And it will position the company for scale with a highly repeatable um, SaaS solution. In terms of specifics, uh, we're seeking an investment of 4 million Australian, which uh, equates to about 2.42 euro, pre-money valuation of um, 12.1 euro. I've included the um, funding case projections below, um, as well as our historical numbers, so you can see our trajectory. Uh, this is another area that 
is a deeper dive and I won't um, attempt uh, too much in this session, but I will highlight a couple of things. Firstly, the year-on-year -year growth in revenues. Uh, we are now creating recurring revenues of one, one million per annum and expect to at least double that very near future. We have a detailed understanding of our cost structure um, and a very good sense of how the costs will respond as we scale our business. And perhaps my last comment is that we think these projections are absolutely achievable. Um, they represent a Series A scenario only. And as we work together to achieve growth targets, it's highly likely that we would pursue a more um, aggressive strategy with follow-up funding. So what we're really looking for are you know, is a, is a partner that wants to come with us on that journey. So to conclude, um, and I'll conclude with just three points and then uh, invite questions. Uh, with a strong footprint in Australia and a proven ability to deliver at scale, both the technology and the business model have been designed from the outset for scale. That business model creates annual recurring revenues that we uh, believe will attract strong valuation um, multiples as the as the company's reven, revenue story, you know, is demonstrated. And we've also got a long term growth story that is compelling as clean energy, IoT, cloud and other technologies proliferate. Um, so we're well positioned to expand. Um, we've achieved um, those important technical and commercial validation milestones. And we believe we've got a, 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 a targeted strategy um, that uses, you know, a first class ecosystem that'll let us um, target that expansion in a very personalised, credible and um, targeted way. Okay, I might now invite questions. Thank you, Stephen. So those of us uh, in Monaco uh, can feel free to ask a question via the standing mic we have. Uh, you can also contact us via the, the chats on Earth Extreme or email us at cleanequity at innovatorcapital.com. So the first one, Stephen, what, what challenges do you, do you see facing in terms of transferring of the technology over to additional markets uh, such as Europe? Uh, gr great question and um, not nearly as intimidating as it might be with um, you know, some of the other technologies that um, you know, uh, are in our space. And part of that is again, our focus on interacting with uh, some of the billing and other solutions that already have those extremely large kind of market shares, SAP and Oracle in terms of the billing and other um, services that they're providing to utilities uh, cover huge um, market segments. And so by being able to partner with them and integrate directly into some of their core systems, um, it significantly streamlines that ability for us to expand into new markets. And then what is the timeline? So how the next 24 months uh, panning out? Um, yeah, another good question, Connor. The, the timeline is we're, we're very focused on um, executing another project uh, very quickly. Um, is well advanced. Um, and that, you know, probably our leading prospect is with SAP. I think that, um, that an exciting development for us in the sense that that's my earlier point then we, we've already got a mass market program that integrates with the uh, Oracle and, and, and one of the other major systems. This would give us SAP coverage as well. And I think ideally position us to um, start approaching new markets. And look, frankly, they are discussions that we're actively happening, uh, that are actively happening now with some of our, um, uh, some of our partners. Very good. Well, thank you for joining us, Stephen. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you for, for starting us off uh, and all the best. Very good. Thank you. So moving on, 
I would like to introduce to the stage here in Monaco, uh, Michael Boot, CEO of Vittoro. Today, I would like to talk about our product, Goldilocks, which is a platform and not a digital platform, but a physical platform for fuels, chemicals, and materials. They teach us in, in pitch trainings to always start with the problem. But I'm not known as one who likes to play by the rules, so I'll tell you what's not the problem. What's not the problem is the trillions in legacy assets that is our fossil world today. There's nothing wrong with the oil refineries, the petrochemical plants, the ships, the yachts, the cars. What is the problem? It's what's going into these assets. The fossil oil and the fossil oil derivatives going into these assets is what's contributing to global warming, climate change, and all sorts of environmentally yeah, devastating effects that we're seeing on the news every day. Fortunately, there's a greener input, greener inputs, and they're there in abundance. You can think about things like sawdust. There's almost as much sawdust produced in the world as a byproduct, residual stream, as we pump fossil oil out of the ground. You can also think about agricultural waste. The problem there is, although these feedstocks are cheap, sustainable, and abundant, you have to try to imagine pushing a bale of hay through fossil world infrastructure like pumps and pipes and tanker trucks. This is the problem. This is what we need to solve. At Fertoro, here's where we come in. We take this residual biomass, low value, abundantly available. We convert it to oil. This oil using existing infrastructure is shipped to existing fossil world assets like an oil refinery, petrochemical plants, and ships. The technology is like making an espresso. It's, I'm not a chemist myself, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I had to create an analogy to understand what we're doing in our company. The, making an espresso is, is easy to explain. Instead of putting water in our espresso machine, we put methanol. Instead of coffee beans, we put this agro-waste or sawdust. Then we turn it on. We go a bit hotter than you would usually do with an espresso, maybe 180, 200C, and we wait. And we get two main products coming out. One product is lignin. I'll get to lignin in the next slide. It's part of the biomass. One part is lignin solubilized in methanol. And lignin solubilized in methanol is our oil product. The other product, so in the waste compartment of our espresso machine, we don't have this residual coffee. We have cellulose. And cellulose has very large liquid spot markets in the paper industry, cellulose ethanol industry. It's very easy to get very high prices. Our planet grows over 200 billion tons of biomass each year, a significant amount of which ends up in residual streams of existing operations, such as sawdust, coffee grounds, and agricultural waste. Materials of seemingly low value, but with high potential. These could be a perfect replacement for oil. In order to get there, we need to separate this biomass into its three main components, cellulose, lignin, and hemicellulose that binds these two together. We have developed a process to do just that. We break the hemicellulose bonds with an acid and turn these into sugars. Next, we separate the three components through a process of filtration and extraction using solvents. This results in three valuable platforms. Ready to use cellulose for new paper and bioethanol factories. 
sugars that can be used for food, feed and chemical applications, and a liquid lignin that can be tailored to specific fuel, chemical and material applications. And that's how residual biomass can bring us one step closer to an oil-free world. I mentioned in the espresso slide that our oil product is methanol with solubilized lignin, which chemically speaking looks nothing like the fossil oil we pump out of the ground. So what does the market think about this different type of oil? If we talk to Shell, Shell sees it as a marine fuel. Basically, anything that has calories and not too much sand is a decent marine fuel especially for these very large uh, container ships. Another market outlet uh, for our oil are crackers. So what happens in an oil refinery is you take a barrel of oil, you make a lot of fuels, whatever's left, they put into a cracker, which is a giant uh, machine that chemically just chops down all these molecules to very small Lego blocks. And from these Lego blocks, everything we see and touch in this world is made from these uh, products coming out of the crackers. So it's a very important market. Going more deeply into the marine fuel aspects, Maersk, which is the largest shipping company in the world, is looking into two alternative fuels. One is ammonia, the other one is methanol. Methanol, they hope, the largest, oil, the largest uh, shipping company in the world, they hope will be blended with lignin, as is our product, to lower the price and to improve the technical properties. Talking about impact, talking about revenue streams, I think it's important to grasp the sheer size of the fossil world. People ask me, what are your revenue projections? How many customers? How many licensees? One container ship is 10,000 metric tons of fuel per year. The bill, their fuel bill, one ship, 5 million euros, one ship. A cracker is even more exciting. One cracker consumes one million metric tons of product. Or 500 million euros of revenue. I always joke, we're one cracker customer away from unicorn status, which is the truth. If you believe in this product, if you believe that it's possible, as Shell attests, that it can be used as marine fuel, used as a cracker fuel, then this product indeed has great potential. Going more to our ask and the status and our plans. We're concluding our seed round in which we raised about 2 million euros to demo the technology. The te technology is being demoed in Sweden with our partner CCAP, which is a Swedish cellulosic ethanol producer. For our next trick in the Series A round, we want to raise 4 million euros to build a commercial scale plant. The first one, one kiloton, one million kilograms, which is peanuts, as you saw on the slides before. This is just a, a stepping stone to a B round one year later for about 10 million euros to build in a port. Could be Rotterdam, could be Monaco. A 10 kiloton plant for a green shipping fuel. Beyond that, we don't really foresee any further fundraising, uh, and we can just get by fantastically with organic growth. And with that, uh, I'd like to conclude and entertain any questions you might have, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael. So first one, uh, can you go a little bit more on, on the competition, uh, different uses for, for the biomass and how you compare? Well, the competition in the biomass uh, domain, if you can call it competition, I think the, the abundance of biomass, as I spoke before, 
200 billion metric tons of biomass is there. In Holland, we're partnering with a waste management company who guarantees us there's no problem to go to whatever scale that we want, just using Dutch waste. There's so much to go around. The challenge is not so much getting your hands on the biomass. The challenge is producing something from biomass that can compete on a level playing field at price parity with fossil equivalents whilst making a profit as a company. Not so much getting your hands on the biomass itself. And then a bit more of a roadmap for the, for the next 18 months or two years. Our plans, you mean, for the next uh, 18 months? Yes, and in terms of the, uh, the plants, the, 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 the scaling up of the plants, the building of the plants. Okay. Well, we operate a pilot plant in the south of the Netherlands at the chemical campus uh, in Geleen, where DSM, a Dutch chemical company, also resides. In that pilot plant hall, there's still room for a one kiloton plant. And because we're using the same engineering team, the same construction firm, and operate within the same permits will be operational with this one kiloton plant by Q3, Q4 next year. So that's with the next 12 months. In parallel to this construction phase, uh, we'll go through all the permitting hoops uh, in a port area for the 10 kiloton one. So within the next 18 months, uh, to answer your question, we'll have an operational one kiloton plant plus a groundbreaking ceremony for the 10 kiloton one in a port. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you, you are aiming at extracting lignin out of pure biomass, I mean, uh, uh, grass or sawdust or whatever, this type of thing. Um, in, uh, in the pulp mills, there are, of course, a lot of lignin com coming out uh, already today, and uh, that is not in a pure form, but quite pure form. Uh, and there is a lot of projects going on to use that lignin that is actually a side stream from the pulp mills to create biofuels. How, for me it sounds a little bit more expensive with your technology to extract lignin from, a ro from a, a, a solid raw material than using the lignin from the pulp industry. How do, how do you compare with that type of lignin? Well, actually the, the way you should view our special machine is an alternative pretreatment technology that can be used in new pulp and paper mills. So this technology competes with craft pulping, soda pulping. Uh, and I like the question because now I have the opportunity to explain why we call our product Goldilocks. With traditional pretreatment technologies like pulp and paper, lignin comes out as a polymer. A polymer is a very, very large molecule which means that it's very difficult to process. You cannot solubilize it, you cannot melt it. It's very difficult to get it into fossil world infrastructure. So polymers are too large, which is happening a lot with, uh, with pulp and paper. A lot of companies active in cracking it directly at the source, going to the smallest Lego blocks possible. But if you do that, uh, create monomers or single ringed uh, molecules then you lose all the high value attributes of lignin. Lignin is a natural UV stabilizer, a natural antioxidant. These are beautiful properties that will generate really a lot of the profit as, as we scale. What we do in our pretreatment process is make oligomers, which are not too small and not too large, but just right, hence the name of Goldilocks. So that's how we differ from pulp and paper. But we could supply our technology to a pulp and paper mill to be used downstream to go from their lignin that's too large, difficult to process, to ours. Or in a greenfield project, we could license our technology and they wouldn't have a lignin problem to start with because we would take our license package comes with an offtake agreement. We want our product. And if you compare, I, I assume you know about the big demonstration plant being built in Sweden right now using lignin rain fuel together with the uh, mm -hmm. oil company Prim and uh, the pulp mill Rottenhus. How would you compare your technology to that type of technology that is now actually being scaled up in large scale? Well, the, in the case of, of rain fuel, they're targeting more automotive fuels, mm. uh, which I do not believe in. Uh, Maersk, Lufthansa, 
and somebody driving a Ferrari, if you take away all the fiscal uh, parts, all the, the taxes, these fuels are exactly the same price. So Maersk pays us for something that's very easy to produce, the same price as uh, somebody driving a car would pay for the product. But our customer in the marine fuel space doesn't have any requirements other than not too much sand. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, So is the process continuous or batch? And if it is continuous, what is the maximum feed per hour? So the pilot plant we operate is batch. It's a large soup kettle, 300 liters. The partnership with CCAP is continuous, and that's in the order of metric tons per hour. Thank you. Uh, what are the typical sources for the solvent feed to your process, and how do you ensure its environmental footprint? That's a great question. So methanol is up and coming. Every single oil major, every large shipping company is investing in power to X, like solar energy, uh, going to chemistry, making methanol from, from sunlight. Or in the case of Shell and Rotterdam, they make methanol out of municipal waste. So around the globe, there is so many sustainable methanol projects uh, up and coming and already some at, at commercial scale. So we'd be sourcing this, but the problem there is that this sustainable methanol will be too expensive and has poor combustion properties, which why it makes sense to blend in something as cheap uh, as our lignant to bring down the price to make it the blend a more feasible marine fuel. But we'd be sourcing uh, sustainable methanol. Thank you, Thank you Michael. So next up, I would like to introduce Sylvia Tenhuten, uh, CEO of Goodhout, to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for um, a number of you for making it live here. And good morning to everyone that's watching um, online as well. 70 billion coconuts are grown each year. And because traditionally only the inside of the coconut gets used, this means almost 70 billion husks are burnt as waste each year. Now imagine a new reality, a new type of material, a new wood alternative that can utilize this waste instead of burning it. My name is Sylvia Tenhouten. I'm the founder of Goodhout. I've been working on this project for the last six, seven years, and it started when I returned to Indonesia, where my mother's uh, roots lie. And when I was there, I saw so much coconut waste. Um, I actually had to Google, what do people do with coconut waste? I mean, at the time, I'm drinking a, uh, a nice, fresh coconut water, as you do when you're in Southeast Asia. Um, but it really affected me that I thought, well, there's, there's so much waste here and it's not being utilized properly. Coconut husk board is our solution to this problem. We make a new biocomposite, fully 100% biobased. We use the fibers of the coconut, but we also use the lignin in the coconut. That is our gluing system. So you can see it in a very basic way, um, um, all organic materials such as grass, wood, coconut is made out of cellulose and hemocellulose plus lignin. And the cellulose are the building blocks and you could consider the lignin as the mortar between the building blocks. And that is what we activate and we use as a binder. The replacement products that uh, we're, we're looking to replace are uh, thermoset plastics, for example, or hardwoods. And um, we do consider ourselves 
the new bamboo. The types of applications are, are actually endless. Um, so consider interior use or flooring or in the future 3D applications. So what's unique about our material is that not only does it have a um, bio-based and 100% natural raw material, we don't use any added, uh, well, any toxic additives, we don't use any additives at all um, at this stage. And then you combine that and you're able to make a fully bio-based uh, performance material. Um, we're extremely hard, we're twice as hard as ebony, we're also naturally flame retardant. This means we burn three times as slowly as untreated wood. And normally to get that level of flame retardancy in wood, you need to use rather not nasty toxic chemicals. We're extremely scratch resistant. We have an extremely low moisture uptake. In the future, we will be 3D moldable. And all of this is achieved without any additives. When designers look at our material, they're always very excited about the fact and the finish that it looks very luxurious. You can see the fibers and um, the, the way you can actually process the material is very flexible. You can mold it with a certain texture in it. You can also use a laser. You can also use milling. And here are a couple of examples of uh, materials that have been made and products. Our launching customer is a, a fashion accessories uh, producer in Italy. And here are a couple of examples, plus a, a lovely, uh, a lovely uh, lamp we've made out of our material as well. So the applications that we're looking to enter initially are flat panels. So think about all the different types of applications you can see in interior use. So for example, for tabletops, decorative walls, even flooring. But in future, we're looking to do um, other types of applications with more uh, difficult uh, 3D molded uh, shapes. We're also looking to continue with our R&D and we will start using some additives to increase some of the properties of the materials, for example, so it becomes fully waterproof outdoors. Here you can see a timeline. We've been working on, uh, on Good House since 2015. Uh, we won a national award in the Netherlands um, for the most innovative circular startup in 2015. Uh, we were incubated at Yes Delft, which is a... Um, uh, a very prestigious uh, incubator in the Netherlands, uh, one of the best business um, incubators associated with the university globally. Um, in 2017, we got our first uh, pre-seed round of 900,000 euros, and we were able to build our laboratory and work on our R&D and our processes. In 2019, uh, you saw some of our materials were being showcased at different events, uh, including Linnea Pella in uh, Milan, where, where um, our materials were being shown uh, with leather goods as the accessories. We also got another 1.2 million in subsidies and funding in 2019. And this year we have a round of funding, we just closed a round of funding of two million in order to be able to build our pilot. This year we were also nominated for the Green Challenge um, um, startup competition, which is the largest green competition globally, so if all the founders that are still listening in, you should check that out. Our research is based around our patents. We have a large, strong team of uh, researchers, and um, we are patent pending in 12 different countries. Um, so uh, all the countries, the main countries where you'd be producing the, the, the coconut material, where we'd be looking to set up the factories, and also the countries that uh, we would like to do ourselves, which is the EU, the US, and Japan and Korea in the future. And as of September, we've actually been um, granted our first round of patents uh, for the EU. 
looking at our total addressable market, we are looking to enter the global green building industry. This is a market worth 325 billion euros. And of that, um, our beachhead market is decorative laminates. And we are looking to enter in, into the high pressure laminate markets and the flooring markets. Uh, these are respectively 8 billion euros and 6 billion euros worth. The types of customers that we're speaking to right now, they generally find us online, um, and these are cold call um, emails, for example. Mainly, two-thirds of them are looking at decorative applications. Uh, some of them are also looking at functional applications with our material. Almost all of them are looking for interior applications. We've got over uh, 10 million euros in sort of initial indications of sales. Um, for example, a Belgian retailer with 600 stores and over 700,000 square meters um, of store uh, uh, area uh, is looking to buy our materials. And a very large Swedish furniture manufacturer, which I will remain unnamed, has also been approaching us for our materials. When looking at our material compared to um, competitors, often we're compared to MDF, uh, but MDF is a medium density fiber board, and in fact we are high density. Um, but as an engineered wood, um, we are very different in the sense that MDF always uses additives and a gluing system. If you look at, for example, bamboo, we're also compared to the bamboo, uh, bamboo always needs to have a gluing system as well. Um, we're most comparable to a compact laminate, uh, but that is always made out of uh, a phenol resin and has toxic additives. And when you look at our material, we exude the luxury and design, we are fully sustainable, we have excellent physical properties, and we don't have any of the added chemicals this is not a green-washed product in it at all. We have a fabulous, well-balanced team of 12 people. Bart Althausen is sitting here with me, and he is our COO, CTO, and he joined the company um, earlier this year. Uh, he has a background in uh, building and running um, plants and was working for a billion-dollar sustainable palm oil company running... 53 plants. And he joined us because he truly believes that Goodhout and our coconut husk board, we are the new bamboo, the new type of material category that in future you will all see um, in shops and retail uh, areas or cafes. Um, when you see coconut husk board, um, it will likely be our material. Uh, we have a strong R&D team. We have four uh, staff members. We have um, a senior sales director and a product launch uh, team member. Our CFO has a lot of experience with startups and we have a very seasoned uh, funding and financial manager. And we also have uh, some support staff. Most interestingly about our team is that our team has stayed the same and stable um, since 2017 when we started um, setting up the laboratory. Um, and this is because everyone is so inspired to participate in being able to make the world a better place. And um, that is always exuded in, in how we relate to each other. Here you can see the development of our production process. So 2017 to 2019, we were able to set up a, a pilot and we are, uh, sorry, a, a laboratory, and we were able to set up um, samples of 30 by 30 centimeters. And right now, uh, Bart and his engineering team are rolling out our basic proof of principle pilot. This is in the Netherlands. And here we will be producing 60 by uh, 120 centimeter panels. At the end of next year, we're looking to roll out uh, 
a demonstration factory, at least do the funding for that. And in the demonstration factory, the panels will be at least 122 by 244, which is a standard commercial size panel. The location of this is either Southeast Asia or the Netherlands. And with the current corona situation, it will likely end up that we will be putting this also in the Netherlands. And as of 2023, we are looking to do our first commercial rollout in a joint venture with a Southeast Asian partner. Our capital requirements, so for the next phase, we're looking for 3.5 million, and this is to be able to make our current proof of principle pilot and make that into um, a scale-up situation where we can start producing more panels and get market traction. Next year, we'll be looking at to funding our demonstration factory, which will be around 10 million plus. And then as of 2023 or 2024, we'll be looking at rolling out our first commercial plant, um, which will be about 25 million. Who are we as Goodhout? I think some of the internal motivators of our company is that not only are we trying to upcycle waste, but we truly believe in giving back to the community. Um, we're looking at um, sourcing our materials in a fair chain, fair trade way, so that the farmers are able to get a fair price for their materials. We would like to set up a charity for the children in the coconut communities where we'll be operating, and also provide access to a micro microfinancing fund for the women in the coconut communities. And for our own local staff, we would like to do continuing education and micro-insurance. And we will always promote gender equality also in Southeast Asia. So our current funding requirements, as I mentioned, our current ask is 3.5 million euros, of which two-thirds of that is for the CapEx for the pilot scale-up process, and about 1.3 million is for the OPEX. My name is Sylvia Ten Houten. I'm the founder of Goodhout. We are looking to be the most successful social enterprise ever, rolling out a new material category and trying to make the world a better place. I invite you all to follow us or join us in making the world and saving the world one coconut at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. So, first question up. Uh, why have the coconuts traditionally been so underutilized? You mentioned, I think, that they uh, are just, just thrown away or wasted. So why have they been so underutilized and what's the breakthrough uh, to actually use them as something sustainable and uh, helpful for us? I think those are two questions. So why are they uh, un underutilized? Um, the traditional uh, products that you can make out of coconut uh, uh, fibers um, are very low value. So traditionally you could ret uh, the fiber out of the coconut and make uh, mats and bristles and brushes. And you also had a, a peat or pith a waste stream. Um, right now um, the peat and pith is being used um, as a... Um, a growing medium for, for plants, uh, but both of these applications are actually uh, very low value. And often um, it's more of a bother to try and transport the husk from the farmers uh, to anywhere else, and it's not even uh, profitable um, for the farmers to, to move their materials, so they end up uh, burning them. And for us, we see that this raw material has so much value, um, and this is for us um, a golden opportunity because we don't see that much competition with regards to uh, use of the raw material. So, Sylvia, I'm, as you know, I love the side streams from the food industry. Uh, my question is, you're right now looking at setting up your own factory to, to produce panels and uh, other things, but um, is the process to make the panels extremely 
uh, difficult or different from the process of making uh, particle boards, for example. Uh, so my question is, can you use existing production processes or do you need to design and build completely new production processes to make your panels? Um, very good question, uh, Martin. It's a little bit of both. Um, so we use existing uh, equipment, for example, from the pre-processing from particle board or MDF uh, industries. But because our raw material is coconut, um, it's not just a, a plug and play. We have to test our, um, our own fibers running through that system. Then you combine that with a um, extremely um, high-tech press, which is um, more well-known in the Formula One industries than the engineered wood industries. So for us, um, we're taking existing uh, equipment and we have to always uh, adjust it for our own uh, raw materials. So right now, we've, we have never found one location where we can actually do our own pilot testing and therefore um, we're, we're setting it up step by step ourselves. Um, second question, I mean, right now you're aiming at selling the boards as such in, in a square meter price by yourself or with a partner, but for the molding, um, molding um, uh, products that you're looking into, Will you be, do you think you will be able to sell a powder form to existing molding companies that could make molded products out of the powder, or do you also need to, to make a very specialized process for that? So what's the specific question? How, how can, do we think? No, or? Well, can you sell uh, the product in a powder form instead of selling it as a finished product? Would it be possible to sell it to customers that have molding, existing molding, yeah, yeah. molding uh, companies, wet molding, for example? Uh, this or, or uh, dry molding, injection molding, what, what type of molding process do you foresee? Yes, so uh, it will be compression molding, um, not yet injection molding, um, although in the future we would like to find some bio-based additives that maybe your company would be able to help us with, for example, um, to be able to do injection molding, but right now it's compression molding. Mm. And um, we know the specifics of how to, to create our material, and the presses have to be very um, specified. So how we foresee the, the, the 3D compression molding in future, um, specific presses and specific molds will have to be used for that. What about uh, mold, molded pulp? Do you think that type of process would work also with, with the powder form of, uh, of coconut? I, I couldn't hear you, sorry. The? Molded pulp, the process to make molded pulp products, do you think that also would be an alternative for your, for your coconut fibers? Um, I'm actually not, I'm not sure because you're, you're talking about um, molded and powdered form and how we do it is, is slightly different from that. Okay. So I'd have to say we have to put a little bit more research into it and, uh, and I can tell you about that maybe in two years, three years time. Perfect. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, very quickly before we have one more in person. Uh, do you have long-term uh, feedstock supply contracts uh, for the price stability for the raw materials? Um, we're working on, uh, on the contracts uh, in Southeast Asia. I've spent the last uh, uh, four years traveling there um, up and down. Um, and for, for right now, the amount of coconut husk that we're using is so little um, that in fact we will have to start setting up and utilizing more of it before it becomes more interesting um, with regard to these contracts. But it's easy to get uh, coconut husk. Um, what's unique is to make sure that you get the right suppliers um, that have the right quality that we need. Um, we uh, have to use uh, fresh coconut uh, raw material. Um, so it's not an alternative for the existing piles, but it's an alternative to, um, let's say, the current processing uh, at um, commercial uh, food uh, coconut factories, for example. I have two questions. One is, um, well, thanks anyway for a very inspiring presentation because it, it, it touches a lot of aspects of sustainability, which I find very interesting. Uh, one is a bit of a naughty question. You just said that there are some people that actually use the waste of the coconuts and they make brushes and things like that, and it's a low added value product, but at the same time, some people build their livelihoods on it. How do you deal with that? Because you're actually taking away the raw materials. 
I think the utilization of um, the, the bristles and uh, the peat and the piss, um, we have calculated that and extrapolated that it is about 5% of the coconut that's available. Um, it's still a real problem in Southeast Asia um, with the piles that are there, for example, um, with also you, with rain, um, you can collect sort of, uh, how do you say it, sort of moisture and have mosquitoes growing in there. Um, and you have snakes if they have large piles on the farms. Um, so it's more of a problem uh, than that we will be taking away some of the, the livelihood of these, these, these people. Okay, and, and then the second question that's more, you mentioned also that you get a lot of requests that people actually that come through your website and then find your material. That does often happen with new materials or new innovations, but at some point you will need to prioritize your channels to market and your strategy. There's actually also a couple of other companies that have gone before you, like Kebony, like I think there was a shell sort of uh, shell spin out hardwood board that yes. have done the same as you have in the past. And then I'm talking about 10, 20 years ago they started. Could you say something about how you are going to go about your road to market and the channels and your prioritization? Please? Yes. Absolutely. Um, so, so currently we're um, a little bit under the radar with regards to um, our potential uh, clients. Of course, you would like to show your, your um, let's say, market momentum and potential. Um, but because we're not able to actually sell much product uh, outside of what we make in the laboratory, we have to be quite careful about the timing um, of, of uh, finding the right clients that um, would like to and need to be able to purchase our materials at a certain time for their projects. Um, so in fact, we're, we're trying to manage um, over 65 um, um, like hot clients right now in order for them to be ready for us when we are able to produce some panels. Um, we expect in the pilot phase that we will be selling directly uh, this has to do with the fact that it is a brand new material. We will not be able to get into uh, distributors and we don't want to, to go through distributors just yet because we also need to be close to our um, launching customers to get the feedback about our material and how it does and how it performs. Um, by the time we get to our uh, demonstration factory and we should have enough volume then, we would like to work through um, decorative uh, panel distributors, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you very much. So that's this morning's coffee break. We shall see you all back after that for Origins presentation.